All right. All right, so let's uh, pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we're going to continue to talk about titrations today. Um, remember, this is this experiment where we start with some acid in a flask, and we're slowly adding base that reacts with that acid, right? And again, you'll do this titration in lab. Uh, all right, let's focus. So the big thing, the hard part about these problems is calculating the pH at each point along this titration, right? We want to know the pH as we're adding our base, okay? And we broke this titration curve into four regions. And that's because for each region, we got a slightly different approach in terms of how we calculate pH. Uh, last time, we talked about strong acid, strong base titrations. Today we'll talk about weak acid strong base titrations, okay? Uh, very, very similar. We got the same four regions to worry about here, okay? We have the initial point before any actual titrant was added, right? That very first point on your curve. You have this equivalence point, which is when the number of moles of acid equal the number of moles of base that have been added. We got this region in between, which is before we've reached our equivalence point, but we've started to add our base in there. And then the last one is after we've just got like a huge excess of base going on in there. All right. So again, now we're going to do a weak acid strong base titration. Okay. So this is going to be our initial problem. A student performs a titration with uh, 250 milliliters of 0.5 molar cyanic acid and is going to titrate in 2.5 molar sodium hydroxide. All right, and again, that first point is just to determine the pH of our initial solution, our initial solution of cyanic acid before any of that NaOH gets added. All right, oh, bummer. Can we undo that? All right, but, sorry, give me a second. So weak acid, strong base. Again, we're going to have a different sort of strategy for each region. That first region is just before any titrant has been added. All right, and so before any titrant's been added, before any, any, uh, any NaOH has been added, I just have a flask of weak acid, right? And we know how to determine the pH of a weak acid solution. What do we need to do? We need to find the concentration of hydronium. Before with strong acids, that was really easy, right? Because the concentration's just the same. Do I get to say that the concentration of hydronium is the same as a weak acid? No. Remember, now all of a sudden with weak acids, we got to do some work. We got to figure out our Ka expression and use that Ka value to determine the pH. Right? So where am I going to find the Ka of cyanic acid? The constants page. So here's our problem. If we go back, we can look it up for cyanic acid. All right, so we got our 2 times 10 to the fourth. Okay, so remember for weak acids, 
Let's get a balanced chemical equation. Oh, whoops, this is 0.5. All right, so HCNO, if I'm talking about my original solution, I haven't added any NaOH, what is the balanced chemical equation that I'm paying attention to? Reacting this weak acid with what? Water, right? For our solution, our solution. We're just going to look at its reaction with water. So everybody take a second and finish off this balanced chemical equation. All right, so again, titration problems, kind of a pain in the butt. They're very long problems, but the good news is, is we get to practice all this crap that we're supposed to have learned about from the previous chapter as well, right? So from chapter 17, we should be able to calculate the pH of a weak acid solution. That's our first step for a weak acid titration, right? We need our balanced chemical equation. Then we're going to build our Ka expression, and then an ice table that's going to help us fill in that Ka expression. All right, so my two products here would be hydronium and that conjugate base, CNO minus. My Ka, my equilibrium expression, I'm going to remember what? Over products over reactants, right? So I'm going to take my concentration of my products, divide it by the concentration of my reactants. All right, so everybody take a second and see if you can't finish this problem off now that we've kind of, uh, whatever, reminded ourselves of how to do this uh, e uh, pH of a weak acid solution. All right, importantly, make sure you can construct this ice table. What's the change in my reactants? What do I put in that change box? Right here. Minus X. And what about in these boxes? Plus X, right? Our, react, our uh, reactants being consumed and our products are being produced. And I don't know how much, right? That's the whole idea. 
So then 0 0.5 minus x, x, and x. So then if we turn around and plug that back into our Ka expression, we get Ka equals x squared over 0 0.5 minus x. All right, and then what do we get to do to this equation that's going to make our lives a little bit easier? I get to drop this part here, right? X is going to be so tiny that I get to say that this is basically the same thing as X squared over 0 0.5. And of course, that equals that Ka value that we looked up, which I don't remember. Something times 10 to the negative 4. What the hell? Is it 2? Thank you. OK. Oh. oh my gosh. OK, so then we solve for x. That equals the square root of 2 times 10 to the negative 4 times 0 0.5. 0 0.01. And then I'm done there. What do I got to do? What does this x represent? x is the hydronium ion concentration. But remember, we like to talk hydronium ion concentration in terms of pH. So I'm going to take the negative log of that value. OK, so. My pH is then 2, All right? The negative log of 0 0.01. OK, so so we had this solution of cyanic acid. said we were going to titrate it okay so then the very first part again that very first region is what is the pH of the initial solution And again, we said that the pH is equal to 2. So that very first point along our titration curve here, right, our initial solution, because this is a weak acid strong base titration, if we're going to make some notes here about how we approach each region, right? So that first region, before any titrate, titrant was added, this is going to be a weak acid pH calculation, just like we learned how to do in chapter 17. All right? That's how we approach that very first data point. All right. So now we're going to move on to the second region here. This is between our initial solution and the equivalence point. How do we approach calculating the pH in this region? Okay. 
Uh, what we had said that we had to do for a strong acid was to first determine how much acid-base reaction has occurred using an ice table, and then calculate the pH of the remaining solution. We're going to do that exact same sort of thing, but we're going to change our strategy just a little bit because of weak acid here. But the first step is going to be the exact same. We've got to figure out how much acid-base reaction has actually occurred. All right, so in region two, which is between regions one and three, between the initial and the equivalence point, we got to do two steps. One, first, determine how much acid base reaction has occurred. Okay, so now we're going to see what or ask ourselves what is the pH after 23 milliliters of that NaOH has been added. All right, again, we're going to take this 250 mils of our 0.5 molar cyanic acid. We're going to start to titrate it now, right? Now we've kicked off our experiment. We're opening our burette and adding that uh, NaOH in there. Um, we got 2.5 molar NaOH, and so we're going to ask ourselves, what's this, the pH of this solution after I've added 23 mils of that 2.5 molar NaOH? Okay, and again, step one is we got to determine how much of this acid-base reaction has occurred. So, previously we did our uh, balanced chemical equation reacting our HCNO with water, all right? But if we're figuring out how much acid-base reaction has occurred, what are we going to react this with? The NaOH. All right, so if this is my acid and this is my base, everybody take a second and tell, uh, give me the products of this reaction here. because the, we're going to need, just as always, our balanced chemical equation. And then from there, we're going to build a nice table. All right, so my products here. All right, so my hydroxide and my acid will create water. All right, this joins up with that to make water. Okay, and you could put these together. So how you would sort of normally see it in a textbook would be like this, the sodium and the cyanate together. If you wanted to just sort of keep it separate, dissociated, like CNO minus and Na plus, that would be okay as well. Those are sort of the same thing, right? The bottom line is you will see it written like this because that positive sodium ion will join up with that negatively charged cyanate ion. Uh, but either one would be, would be fine. Now we need to make an ice table here. All 
But there was something kind of special about our ice table once we've started our titration that we have to remember. What, what are our units for our ice table once we've started our titration? We have to be in moles, right? It won't work in concentration anymore because I'm adding a bunch of volume. I'm changing the volume. So we have to do our ice table in moles, right? Or we can do millimoles if it's more convenient, which it will be when the uh, volume is given to you in milliliters, All right? So again, given our initial problem here, everybody take a second and see if you can't fill out that ice table. Right, remember, we got to use the fact that volume times molarity gives you moles. All right, that's how I'm going to figure out moles. And if I use my volume in milliliters times molarity, that's how I get millimoles. So if I have 250 milliliters of a solution that's 0 0.5 moles in one liter, I get 125 millimoles. All right, again, the liters cancel out, but the milli doesn't, so I'm left with millimole. Right, but again, volume times concentration. We said that there were 20, 23 milliliters of 2.5 molar NaOH. So 23 milliliters times my 2.5 molar gives me 57.5 millimoles, right? And I start out with zero of my product, okay? So just going back to this balanced chemical equation real quick, one thing that I just kind of want to point out, uh, when we use sodium hydroxide or any sort of hydroxide, uh, sodium hydroxide is what? A strong base, a weak base? Strong base, right? So this strong base 100% dissociates when you put it into water, right? And when you put it into solution, it becomes hydroxide ions and sodium ions. So what's actually sort of participating in this reaction, the sodium isn't doing crap, right? It's just this hydroxide ion that's actually involved in the reaction. The sodium ion is what we would call a spectator ion. It's there floating around, having a good time, watching the action. It's not actually involved in the chemical reaction at all, okay? So again, that's why I was saying that you could sort of just split these up, Na plus, and then our conjugate base. It's just convention to combine them together since one's positively charged and the other one's negatively charged. What's up? Your hydroxide, when you're reacting your acid with your strong base, yes, water will always be a product, right? Because it's that hydroxide ion 
that joins with the H from your acid to make water. All right, so yes, water will always be a product of that acid-base step. All right, so if I have 125 millimoles of my weak acid and 57.5 millimoles of my strong base, how much of this reaction is going to occur? All of the strong base, right? That was the same logic we applied last time. All of our strong is going to react. So that means that I'm going to have every bit of that 57.5 millimoles of strong base reacting. And since this reaction's one to one, I'm going to have that same amount of my acid reacting. So then what should I put in this box right here? Plus 57.5, right? Now my reactants, my products are going to go up in concentration or up in moles. So this reaction will produce my, pro uh, my products here. So then I got to do my math. I get 67.5 millimoles of my weak acid. How many millimoles of strong base do I have left over? Zero, Zero right? Because again, all of it reacts. And then I have 57.5 millimoles of my conjugate base here. I'm actually going to leave it like this. Okay, so step one was to determine how much acid-base reaction has occurred. Check, check. Right, so now we've figured out how much of this reaction has occurred. So then step two was to determine the pH of the remaining solution. Now, in the strong acid, strong base titration, this step was also easy because I just had a concentration of HCl. I took the negative log. I was done and done, right? Now we have this weak acid, so we're going to have to approach this step a little bit differently, all right? But what do I have floating around in my flask at this point? What's left over here? My weak acid, but also its conjugate base. And we have a special name for a mixture of weak acid and its conjugate base, a buffer, right? So for a weak acid strong base titration, this region here, between our initial solution and our equivalence point, we have a buffer, right? A mixture of weak acid and its conjugate base. And that can make our lives a little bit easier because for buffers, what do we get to use to calculate pH? The Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, right? So a little bit more of a pain in the butt than strong acid, strong bases, but not too bad because Henderson-Hasselbalch got us that simplified equation. So for weak acids determining the pH of our remaining solution, this is a buffer. So we get to use that pH equals pKa plus the log of the concentration of base over acid. Uh, again, not a formula you have to have memorized. It'll be on the constants page. Uh, but again, want to know when to use it. We said it was specific to buffers. But again, in that region on our pH curve, we actually have a buffered solution. So we get to use this equation here. My pKa is going to be the negative log of that Ka value that we looked up, which was 2 times 10 to the negative 4. All right. And then this is the concentration of base over the concentration of acid. Remember, up here we have millimoles, all right? What's concentration, though? What are the units? The big M molarity stands for what? Moles per liter, right? So I'm going to put my moles of base. Where did that just go? All 
All right. And we could figure out what that volume is, but I just want to show you real quick. Let's just say that that volume is V. We actually know what it is. It's the 23 mils plus our 250, right? But point being is that if I take this, I'll just leave it as V for right now. 67.5 millimoles of acid. It's going to be divided by that same volume, right? So what happens to the volume portion of this equation here? It actually cancels out. So we can use millimoles in our Henderson Hasselbach since the volumes are going to be the same. It'll sort of cross out. You could absolutely go in and calculate those uh, concentrations. It's just like an extra step, right? So we can save ourselves a step by noting that volume will cancel out here. And so this will just be the same as if I take the ratio of those two moles. Because the volumes are the same, yep. So specifically for this equation, we're going to see here in a second, we're going to have to account for the volume. But specifically using this equation, we don't have to worry about it. All right, so I plug that into my calculator and I see that my pH is 3.63. What's up? You could, so yes, so you could, if, in order to calculate concentration, you could divide both of these by, what was it, 250 plus 23, the 273 milliliters. That will totally work, right? My point was is that since both of these are the same number, they will cancel out. And so you basically, you don't have to do that extra work. You could just leave it as millimoles. You could definitely do the, the full volume. You could do it the full way, absolutely. It'll just be equivalent. All right, so. Again, sort of just making notes of, as to how we approach these different regions of our pH curve. That first region, it's just a, uh, calculating the pH of a weak acid solution. In our second region, we have to determine how much acid-base reaction has occurred. We use an ice table. Got to remember that it's in moles. All right, and we can also make a note that the sort of principle here is that all of our strong base will react. In our second region, now we had to determine the pH. All right, and our little trick was to note that what we just created was a buffer. So we could use that Henderson-Hasselbach. All right, so again, for our pH curve, we got different strategies for different regions. This initial region is just a weak acid solution. Calculate the pH like we learned how to do for weak acid solutions. In this middle region here, this is this buffer region. So again, we got to account for how much reaction has occurred, but then what we're left with is a buffer solution, so we can use that Henderson-Hasselbach to figure out the pH. So now we get to move on to our third region, the equivalence point. Okay, so now let's figure out how many NaOH, uh, how much NaOH we have to add to reach the equivalence point. 
and then we're going to determine the pH. All right, so let's remember what it means to be the equivalence point. That means that the uh, rather moles of acid equal moles of base. Right, or we can do millimoles of acid equals millimoles of base. Oops. Okay. Equiv. So again, millimoles of acid equals millimoles of base. How many millimoles of acid did we find that we had? 125 millimoles of our HCNO. And so that means we're going to have to fit uh, at the equivalence point, how many millimoles of base do we got? 125. Okay, so that part's easy. A little bit trickier is what volume of our sodium hydroxide solution, which was this 2.5 molar NaOH, do we have to add to reach our equivalence point? Right? We know how many millimoles we should have. That part was easy. But what volume of NaOH did we just put in in order to get there? Uh, the 57, that was, that was the previous problem, right? So now we've got to figure out here. We know we have millimoles. So look, again, we have this equation. Volume equals molarity. Uh, nope, volume times molarity. equals those millimoles, if we use milliliters. Now we have our molarity, and we have how many millimoles of base. We just need to rearrange this equation to figure out what volume we would use. Right, so I have my milliliters times that 2.5 molar gives me 125 millimoles. How am I going to rearrange this to solve for milliliters? What am I going to do? Divide both sides by 2.5, right? Move that over. And so I would find that I would need 50 milliliters of my 2.5 molar NaOH to reach the equivalence point. All right, so at our equivalence point, the first thing we have to do is determine the volume of base added. Again, the millimoles part's easy. I just have the same number of millimoles of acid as I do base. But we got to figure out that volume.
Okay. So now we're going to figure out how much of this acid-base reaction has occurred. We can use an ice table. The ice table is pretty straightforward because, again, we know that we have the same amount of acid as we do base, right? And we're starting out with no of our conjugate base. How much of this is going to react? All of it, right? So I'm going to use up all 125 millimoles of my acid reacting with 125 millimoles of my base. And so then what's going to happen to my millimoles of my conjugate base? It's going to increase by 125. So at this point, what do I have in my flask? just that conjugate base, right? At the equivalence point, I have only conjugate base in that flask, right? So my equivalence point, this is a weak base solution. And how do we determine the pH of a solution of weak base? Similar to how we learned how to do it for a weak acid, right? We got to go through, it's not, not quite as straightforward as strong acids or strong bases. It's a little bit more of a pain in the butt. But again, what we learned how to do in chapter 17. So we just have to keep in mind how much weak base we have. So if I want the concentration of CNO, I'm going to take that 125 millimoles and divide it by what? What's the volume of this solution? The 50 that I added plus my 250 that I started with, right? So 300 milliliters. Again, this is my 250 plus the 50 added. All right, so in these last few minutes, everybody take a second, work with your neighbors, see if you can tell me what the pH of a solution of weak base is, given the concentration and the Ka of, that con of its acid, all right? So this just kind of simplifies to a problem.
If I'm going to determine the pH of a solution of this conjugate base here, my chemical reaction, I got my conjugate base reacting with what? With water. When I'm determining the pH of a solution. And remember, for bases, they will be accepting a proton, so I'll be creating hydroxide and that uh, conjugate acid or my original acid. So my KB expression Filling in my ice table. All right, this is that 0 0.416 continued. All right, and I have accounted for all of this reaction that's occurred, so I actually don't have any of this at this point, right? So those are zeros for the products of this reaction. I'm trying to figure out how much of this solution uh, reaction has happened in this solution. Again, I get to make that assumption that x is really small. So this is the same thing as x squared over 0.416 continued. And how am I going to get the KB for my conjugate base? And this will be on your constants page, all right? But you do need to know when to use it. Ka times KB equals that magic 10 to the negative 14 number. Right, so the Ka of an acid times the Kb of its conjugate base equals that 10 to the negative 14. So if I need to find that Kb, I'm going to do 10 to the negative 14 over Ka. And that Ka was just that same Ka that we looked up before, that 2 times 10 to the negative 4. All right, so we're, we're out of time here. Um, I'm going to finish this up real quick and put down the answer so that you guys can do it on your own. And then remember that the X that we solve for is not hydronium, but hydroxide. So we're going to have to take 14 minus the negative log of X. Get 8.66.